Well, hello everybody. Here's another episode of Tim Rambles on about wine. So uh, this one I want to talk about fermentation, uh, pretty much the reason why we're all here. Uh, and I'm going to break this lecture up into a couple of pieces. Uh, step one is going to be sugar transport and degradation. So overall, what do we want to look at is we're going to look at the history of fermentation just a little bit, very glancing. Uh, then we'll talk about why do uh, yeast uh, utilize sugar. We're going to talk about the role of sugar transport uh, nitrogen, sugar metabolism, and overall survival factors. Uh, the first lecture we're gonna focus on is sugar transport and uh, sugar metabolism. Uh, this is the primary focus of this particular episode. So fermentation uh, actually is the process of deriving energy from the oxidation of organic compounds such as carbohydrates using an endogenous electron acceptor, which is usually an organic compound. Um, we'll just leave that at that. Um, and interesting is uh, it comes from uh, fermentium, which is Latin to boil. Uh, and back in the day, they used to think it was magical spirits that came along that made uh, the grape juice boil. And then afterwards, you drink it and feel all funny. So how interesting is that? And then uh, we've also decided that uh, the study of fermentation is known as zymology. So if you ever want to break that one out at a party. So the history is, is that Louis Pasteur was the first zymologist. And I think it's really fascinating to me just thinking about medical science and how far we've come. You know, just you know, a little over 150 years ago, uh, he wrote that I'm of the opinion that alcoholic fermentation never occurs without the simultaneous organization, development, and multiplication of cells. If asked what consists of the chemical act whereby the sugar is decomposed, I am completely ignorant of it. So isn't that fascinating that 150 years ago, uh, basically, people thought it was still magical spirits that caused uh, fermentation to happen. Um, but it was really interesting that 1907, so still just a little over 100 years ago, um, uh, that he thought that yeast made this compound called zymase, that they pushed out an enzyme that broke down the sugar outside. Um, and he was the first person to ever um, isolate uh, the enzymes that yeast produce uh, during uh, fermentation. So uh, amazing how far we've come in, a, in my opinion, a pretty short period of time. Uh, fascinating time to be alive. Uh, primary, uh, primarily before that, uh, previous to that, you know, 3,000 years ago, um, when we were still making wine, we had no idea what caused it. So pretty fascinating. So what is fermentation? Let's think about this in a more global sense. So if we just thought of like a yeast cell as a little black box, it has inputs. What's the sugar? Some sugar, some amino acids, maybe some oxygen or not, um, into a cell. And then output, we get all this cool stuff. We get maybe some CO2, some, uh, some hydrogen peroxide, we get hydrogen sulfide, we might get some uh water out of the deal depending on how the cell decides to act we get you know energy it gets hot it creates heat there's ethanol there's carbon dioxide there's all these esters which are little baby alcohols there's glycerol there's these carbonyl compounds maybe even thiols the the uh, passion fruit and guava aromas in a good sense or the negative thiol sense which where it smells like a burning tire fire or hydrogen sulfide um yeast produce all these things they produce literally thousands and thousands of compounds so yeast take a very non-complex beverage, you know, look at the input side, fairly simple list, a uh, small shopping list, and then the outputs are tremendous. A very complex beverage comes out the other side uh, due to yeast. So why the heck do they do all this? Well, they like sugar. Um, at the end of the day, yeast want to consume sugar. They love sugar, um, just like you and me. Um, we're all born out of the same soup. Uh, I like to think that humans think we're all fancy and special, but you know, we like to consume the same, same things they do. And so yeast are a little bit simpler organisms, but in the grand scheme of things, they really like to eat sugar. Um, the sugars that they like are small ones. They like monosaccharides and maybe a few disaccharides. So monosaccharides like glucose and fructose, which is in grape juice, uh, sucru, sucrose, which is uh, glucose and fructose stuck together, which is uh, refined white sugar, and they're happy to consume that too. And then they'll even eat some types of maltose um, as well, which we find in beer. But things like maltriose that are like trisaccharides that get too big, those get really hard for yeast to consume. So anything bigger than a, a couple of uh, carbon units is, is too much. So um, uh, primarily we're gonna be focusing on the little simple sugars uh, like glucose and fructose. So fermentation overview, let's just take a look at the basics. So what happens during fermentation? So one of the things that we do is we take a look at our, our fermentation here and early on uh, we'll take a look here and we see that uh, we inoculate right here. Now, whether we inoculate through adding yeast or, or through um, just natural processes, what happens is for the first few days, um, uh, even day or so, the yeast just basically reproduce. 
and they're just building up mass. They're just starting to grow, but they really aren't ferment, fermenting yet. And during this period of time, we really don't have any al alcohol yet. So what's happening is, is the yeast are reproducing. And then we hit this sort of exponential growth phase where this is a logarithmic scale. So the yeast are multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. And then eventually we reach a point uh, where the number of yeast growing versus the number of yeast dying um, is equal is equal. So there's no more uh, population growth. And so interestingly enough, I think if you kind of uh, take a look at humanity or anything else, but if you wanted to look at any um, microorganism, uh, the way that it works, there's always a growth uh, plateau in a death phase. Well, if you think about being a human, uh, we're right around here right now. This is where we're hanging out. We're in that uh, top of the exponential growth phase. And so what's interesting is, is generally in microorganisms, whatever they're going to do, whatever their grand scheme or goal is, always happens uh, during their uh, stationary phase. So whatever our goal is, as people, is probably going to happen here. So that's the end of the philosophy lesson. But let's go ahead and get into yeast. So what happens is, is that at this point in time, uh, this is where the primary uh, amount of fermentation is happening. This is where most of the alcohol is being produced. And then eventually there's alcohol being produced. The sugars are disappearing. And then we run out of nutrients. We run out of sugar. And then it becomes a very toxic environment to, for yeast to live in. And then there's a decline in death phase. So that's why we see that fermentation curve go so rapidly. And then as the yeast sort of die off, we sort of have this uh, end of fermentation. So let's talk about the basic facts. Um, during alcoholic fermentation, yeast cells will increase to about one to two times 10 to the eighth cells per milliliter, which is quite a few. Um, for, sugar, for sugar simulation, the distinction exists between the exponential growth phase, where 50% of the sugar is directed to biomass and energy production, the stationary phase, where the other 50% of the sugar is directed towards energy production and byproduct formation, namely those uh, sugars, esters, and other alcohols, without a significant change in cell biomass. Mass. And then the decline in death phase, which is once the sugar is mostly depleted, ethanol makes the yeast cells leak. And we'll talk about what happens then. And it's really difficult for uh, yeast to continue to survive. A very difficult environment. So those are the three phases, uh, the exponential phase, the stationary phase, and then the decline and death phase. And so this is pretty interesting. This is one of those graphs, but looked at in real time. So this is our uninoculated carbon year from 2016, uh, where we see in the uh, beginning, we have a whole lot of uh, yeast cell variability. Um, and then what happens is, and this is really kind of similar to people, where we have a whole lot of different uh, tribes all vying for their position. And then once fermentation begins and alcohol starts to form, we can see that only a couple of yeast cell uh, populations really, really tolerate ethanol well. Um, and they, they, they dominate the fermentation for a while. But then once alcohol becomes a little bit more robust, you can see that maybe these aren't quite as tolerant. So this is probably moving somewhere into that, you know, four, five, six percent alcohol. And then once we get up to 10, 11, 12 percent, notice we have all these other strains that show up. And there's actually about 50 strains represented in here. And uh, this is like the cockroaches coming out to clean up after uh, everything else has died off. And so these are the really tolerant, uh, you know, ethanol tolerant wines or yeast cells. And they came in to, to kind of clean up and finish the fermentation. But still that same uh, exponential growth, then we have our more or less plateau phase, and then we have our decline and death phase. Uh, still, even in uninoculated wines, they, they, you know, perform the same. So let's talk about sugar metabolism. And basically the first steps in fermentation. You know, what are yeasts trying to do? So in this case, in fermentation, our primary thing that we're looking at is how do yeast get the sugar into their cell? Their cell membrane is a very tightly knit um, a layer of, of fatty acids, uh, namely made out of uh, cholesterol and ergosterol, and they're, they're stuck together. And the yeast have to be able to, you know, have little mouths more or less that pull the sugar into their cell. Um, the thing is, is that that membrane structure limits the free movement of most solutes. So transporters are necessary. There has to be a way to transport that sugar into the cell. So let's talk about those. The first one is diffusion. Diffusion is a really easy way for yeast to consume. It's just basically there's more sugar outside the cell than inside the cell. Now, something that's really interesting about this is we talk about 
osmotic stress. So you'll hear the idea of osmotic stress. That's where there's so much sugar outside of the cell that it's putting pressure on the yeast and it's forced, forcing the sugar inside the yeast cell. This isn't ideal for uh, yeast now because they're going to get more sugar than they want. That means they can't process it as fast as they would like. And this becomes a pretty big issue once sugar content gets above about 23 or 24%. This force feeds the yeast. It's almost like the fagua of yeast. And, and so that sugar gets in the yeast cell faster than the yeast can process it. And so the yeast kind of freak out and they'll make it into anything they can. And frequently when it gets higher in uh, sugar content, they'll make some different compounds. Number one thing they'll make at high sugar levels is volatile acidity, which is toxic to yeast, good old acetic acid. And we'll talk about VA here in a little while uh, in another lecture, but that's one thing they'll produce. Another thing that they'll produce is they uh, get really stressed out. So they'll make uh, some different types of fatty acids that are also toxic to them in the long run, just to get that sugar out of their system. They don't like it a whole lot. So high sugar environments makes it really difficult for yeast because they can't control the speed at which they're being fed. So diffusion is something that happens, happens more so at higher levels of sugar, um, where you're in that 23, 24, 25 bricks range, 26, 27, absolutely. And then things like ice wine, they have no control and it's really difficult for yeast to ferment in that. Facilitated transport is exactly what yeast love. This is eating on their terms. Um, it's known as facilitated diffusion. It's basically what they're doing is they're creating a little bit of an enzyme to help move the sugar into their cell at a pace that they like, that they can consume uh, the sugar properly. It doesn't take a ton of energy, it takes a little bit of permease uh, production. And remember permease, anything that's an A's at the end is an enzyme and enzymes are proteins and yeast make all their proteins out of nitrogen. So you're gonna hear me when we roll on into nitrogen, um, they make them out of either whether it's ammonium or the amino acids that are around, they are reaching out and using that nitrogen in order to control that sugar flow into their cell. Um, this is the dream world for Saccharomyces. They really like facilitated transport. This is where the bulk of fermentation happens. Um, it's happening probably through most of fermentation until you get down to maybe that, you know, somewhere between six and 10 bricks, then things shift in yeast. Uh, that's when the decline in death phase happens. That's when their cell gets harder to, it becomes more permeable and things get a little rougher. So again, facilitated transport is the bulk of fermentation. Then at the very end, we have active transport. And active transport is really tough. And what's happening in active transport is we're taking sugar from a fairly low sugar environment and pulling it into the cell. And so this requires not only a permease, but it also requires ATP in the process, which is a lot of energy. It's burning a lot of energy. And what's happening is in the process, not only is it having to pull the sugar in, but it's also having to pump acid back out of the cell. So it's a really difficult place for yeast to be. This is that end of ferment stage. This is where yeast are using not only, not only are they leaking, they're having to utilize more energy to pull that sugar into their cell. It's a really difficult place to be. So here's an example of what's going on. So whenever a uh, active transport's going on, not only does the sucrose need uh, permease to pull the sugar in, but in the same process, it's pulling in a, a, a hydrogen ion. So it's bringing in acid into the cell. Well, the inside of a yeast cell is basically neutral. It's pretty neutral pH, pH six to seven, and it's bringing in an acid into the cell, which isn't good. And so then the yeast have to burn an ATP to pump that hydrogen back out in order to maintain its intercellular redox balance. Again, really hard. Not only we're bringing sugar, it's also bringing in acid. The cell's already leaking uh, because that membrane's starting to fall apart. It's a really difficult place to be for yeast. So the question is, why did yeast do this? Why would they put themselves through all of this work? Well, they do it to produce energy and reproduce. Um, there are two ways, uh, basically, that this happens. The first step is known as glycolysis, where uh, yeast take glucose and turn it into pyruvate. And then after that, there are two other methods. There's either respiration, which we'll talk about, which yeast don't really do, um, or fermentation, which is uh, pyruvate, where they turn it into aldehyde and then ethanol. So we're going to break those down and, and talk about 
what those two different systems are. So the first step is always glycolysis. Take some sugar, we make a little bit of energy, um, and in the process, we also use some other energy, NAD and NADH. Um, point is, it doesn't matter. Um, I've never stood over a ferment wondering what the heck's going on in that respect. But what I do think about is we have some sort of sugar coming in, and then we go to pyruvate. Pyruvate is like the fat of a yeast cell. It's yeast always make pyruvate, and then after they make pyruvate, they decide what they're going to do with it. So whether it goes into glycolysis or it goes or goes in or whether it goes into fermentation or respiration, um, it starts with pyruvate. So we go glucose to pyruvate, and then we uh, we switch from there. So if uh, uh, we're going to respire, this is the dream world for yeast. They take in sugar, they turn it into pyruvate. And then in the process, they send it off to the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle. And in that process, they generate 38 ATP. All that matters here and all that you care about that makes any difference at all. If yeast respire and they breathe, they can take one sugar and make 38 energies. That's all you got to remember. One sugar, 38 energies, respiration. So if they're breathing and they have oxygen, they make a lot of energy out of one sugar. Um, however, Where's the booze? There isn't any. Uh, so obviously yeast don't do this very often. Um, in their dream world, they would just take some sugar and some oxygen and make a whole lot of energy, but they don't. And the reason for that is, is it's an adaptive evolution. Um, the yeast make alcohol because alcohol is an antimicrobial. If they make alcohol, they'll kill everything else off and they'll be able to keep all the sugar for themselves. And let's talk about what that means very functionally to yeast. So let's talk about fermentation. Uh, fermentation is not the ideal situation for yeast. They don't want to do it. It's not their best case scenario. Uh, they, they don't make much energy. Uh, it creates uh, alcoholic byproduct, which eventually kills them. Um, but in the process, they get to own the microbiological world of, uh, of the wine. Whereas if they couldn't do that, there'd be a lot of other opportunistic organisms that would be more than happy to take that sugar. But once alcohol comes into play, very few uh, bad actors can enter the equation. So during fermentation, 95% of sugar is converted to ethanol. 1% um, is converted to cell, uh, cell biomass, so you know, making up the cell. And then 4% of it is converted to the other end byproducts. So uh, any of those other esters, the other alcohols, uh, remember, there are 30 different alcohols being produced during fermentation, not just ethanol. It's the dominant. Um, and our average temperature increase is about uh, 3 degrees per 27 grams liter of uh, sugar fermented. So that's uh, realize how much energy is being produced by those yeast, uh, not only in terms of byproducts, but also in terms of, of exothermic energy. Um, and then you could use that if you were an engineer, per se, to help uh, design your cooling systems. You could figure out how much sugar you're going to ferment, how much heat the yeast are going to uh, produce uh, by degrading that sugar, and then how much refrigeration you could calculate off of that. So that's one of the reasons I throw that out there. So again, in fermentation, same thing. Everything starts the same. Uh, glucose to pyruvate. So making sugar, and then in the process, we're going to get a little bit of pyruvate. So that's the primary goal, is that glucose to pyruvate pathway. But here's where I want to show you where everything changes. So rather than going off to the Krebs cycle, glucose goes to that pyruvate, and then this is where things change. Pyruvate goes to acetylaldehyde, acetylaldehyde goes to ethanol. Um, and why this is important to know is that when we're driving style and talking about style in terms of wine production, um, we can do a couple of things. And primarily, it occurs right here. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more uh, when we talk about driving style in yeast in, in using fermentation. But if you add SO2, to a wine, it messes up the enzyme that does this. So if you add SO2 on the front end, you interrupt this process and you'll leave acetylaldehyde behind in the wine. And why that's important to remember is, we add a lot of SO2 up front, we end up with more acetylaldehyde, which will then end up doing two things. In a red wine, it might end up producing more acetylaldehyde, which is our tannin glue, which helps us to polymerize stuff, which is cool. 
Um, on the downside is if we add a lot of SO2 up front, um, in a white wine, we have more acetyl aldehyde. And the primary thing that binds up SO2 in white wines is acetyl aldehyde. So if you add more SO2 on the front end of a white wine, you'll produce more acetyl aldehyde and end up having to use more SO2 on the back end. So if you're trying to limit the amount of SO2 that you're using, um, you need to use less up front and you'll use less later. Um, and one other kind of interesting note is, um, outside of regular fermentation is, is you take a wine through malolactic fermentation after it consumes all the, the, the malic acid, the citric acid, and the sugar, it'll eat acetaldehyde. Um, so uh, in a lot of ways in winemaking, this compound right here is one of the most important ones we learn how to bat around. So just remember that SO2 interrupts this process. And, um, and so adding a little bit more up front can, can cause you to end up interrupting this process and end up with more acetaldehyde in the wine, which is it good or bad? Well, it sort of depends on what your goals are, but just an important thing to remember. But at the end of the day, let's take a look at this whole equation. Glucose to ethanol only makes two ATP. And that's the energy that yeast get, only two. So in fermentation, they only get two. They take one glucose and end up with two ATP, two energy molecules. In respiration, when they're breathing, they get 38. Oh my gosh, why on earth would yeast do that? Well, basically, so they can make that alcohol to kill off all the other bad actors. So what the heck? Why, what do we name this phenomenon? Well, it's called the Crabtree effect. And so this is pretty interesting. Yeast will still make alcohol in the presence of oxygen. Um, so in high sugar environments, respiration is repressed even in the pres presence of oxygen. So yeast will still continue to ferment even if we add oxygen during the fermentation. However, they will use a little bit of that oxygen, they'll suck it up, and they'll use it to make fatty acids and sterols to build up their cell membranes, and it makes them a stronger and more robust organism to be able to survive the end of fermentation. We're going to talk a little bit about survival factors in the next lecture, but realize that because of this, they're working hard for the money. They're getting only $2 instead of 38 for processing the same amount, all so that they can make that alcohol to drive off other uh, microorganisms. So here's a quick little short and sweet, uh, all that stuff on the previous slide. And basically it's pyruvate to aldehyde to ethanol. This is what you need to know. Um, and this is the system that uh, we basically create in wine. Glycolysis to pyruvate to aldehyde to ethanol. Um, and that is the step. And remember, if you add SO2, you kill that enzyme. Um, so just a, a quick reminder for a way to, way to play the system if you want to. All right, so real quick review. Uh, review our three types of sugar transport. We have diffusion, which is high sugar environment to low sugar environment inside of yeast cell. Facilitated diffusion, where we have um, the yeast cell controlling the flow of sugar into its cell membrane. And then we have active transport, which is where the yeast having to scavenge very actively for that sugar at the end. Um, then we also want to talk about when we have fermentation, once that sugar gets into the cell, the process of glycolysis is that initial degradation of sugar to pyruvate. And then after that, what do yeast cells do with pyruvate? Do they respire it uh, where they can make 38 ATP? Usually they don't. And the reason that they don't is that making water would actually make the whole situation worse because by producing water, those yeast cells are gonna uh, you know, leave the door open to other uh, microorganisms. Whereas fermentation allows them to produce ethanol. And if they can take that you know, sugar to make the pyruvate and then turn it into ethanol, we put ethanol in the system and it allows, even though it's toxic to the yeast, it keeps all the other bad actors at bay and then they get to keep all of it for themselves. And that's it. See you on the next lecture.